Hi guys, today we're going to be looking at the nature of warfare and essentially we're going to be looking at the technologies that are used and where we fought in World War I. Unlike earlier wars, World War I was fought across a large part of the world and involved many countries. So before it used to be civil wars or it might be skirmishes between um, neighbouring countries. However, World War I was a combination of... Um, Pretty much skirmishes between nations but also amongst nations and it involved pretty much the empires fighting against one another. So Britain, France and Russia fought against Germany and its allies on the Western Front. Germany also fought Russia on the Eastern Front. There was also fighting in Turkey in the Middle East and in North Africa. Finally there were small conflicts in the Pacific Ocean and with a combined effort of Japanese and Australian forces took over German colonies in New Guinea. So before we even started in Gallipoli, we had actually taken over um, New Guinea, which was in 1914, so it was towards the end. The common feature across all regions and theatres was the emergence of new technologies. So when we're looking at new technologies, we were talking about military vehicles and the weapons. They were just improved. So we were under the impression that certain battles were going to take place hand to hand that it's going to be you know simple sort of you know run at the enemy sort of things that were fought in wars before however it didn't actually occur that way and with the invention of the machine gun with artillery with chemical weapons it pretty much changed the way that we fought wars so deadly new chemical weapons and gases were also significant um, development during this time and it was pretty detrimental to pretty much anybody involved. So these new weapons were blamed for extending the war as the conflict quickly became an evenly matched battle of technology and tactics, with neither side able to break the deadlock. This was mainly due to the emergence of trench warfare. So because, let's say for example, the Germans happened to come up with a new tank, what would happen is the British would then come up with a similar sort of tank, but they would capture a German one, for example, find out what they had, and then add it to their current one. So they're constantly trying to one-up one another. Um, and when it came to trench warfare, there's no way you can win a war in trench warfare. right? You always have people who are going to dig trenches, and we're going to look at that a bit later. Um, but you build one trench and you take that over, and what happens is another trench, trench is already built a couple of... Um, you know, 100 metres back or so. So you're never actually winning. You take one trench, only have to take another. I think one really clear way of understanding the shift in World War I in terms of technology is that soldiers rode in on horses and they left in airplanes. At the beginning of World War I, Warfare is almost in the 19th century style. The French sincerely believe that going at the troops with determination at enemy troops is the way to go. What they don't understand is the collision of technologies. General Pershing didn't believe in the trench warfare. He grew up on the plains fighting in Indian warfare where it was an open confrontation. So he trained his troops to fight in the open warfare. The British and French generals thought he was crazy. They criticized him for this. It's impossible to cross that deadly beaten zone, the deadly zone between the two lines. The most determined line of soldiers cannot oppose a machine gun that fires hundreds of rounds a minute. World War I wasn't just the first industrial war, it was also the first scientific war. It was the first time that societies had taken all of their resources of science and intelligence and said, how do we do this better? How do we fight better? How do we develop technologies? A lot of the armaments you see in World War I had been used before. Submarines, trench warfare, Gatling guns, machine guns. What happens during World War I is that these become mature and these become even more destructive. During the war, the governments of all the different warring powers put enormous amounts of time and effort into scientific and technical development. 
so that the advancements, which would have happened anyway, happen at a much more rapid pace, and they happen according to the priorities of the warring powers. Something happened in trench warfare that changed the course of the war and changed the way we understand warfare today, and that is chemical warfare. The first gas attack it was at a place called Vimy Ridge, and it was mostly Canadian soldiers who were being attacked. And the Canadian soldiers who were in the trenches saw this cloud of haze coming towards them. They had no gas masks. They had no equipment to protect them. Chlorine gas causes your lungs to fill with liquid. And so essentially you drown from the inside out. It was really the first war in which all of the technologies and science and industry of the 19th century were put to the sole purpose of killing people. So you heard in that video about the commanders who believed that they would win the battle by, you know, racing headstrong into battle with courage and persistence, and you'd win. However, machine guns pretty much eliminated that particular um, style of battle because they were capable of firing up to 600 rounds of ammunition or bullets right, in short bursts. And they could take under, or they could take out 250 soldiers uh, quite easily and it'd be the standard equivalent of the same amount, right? They did overheat and they were difficult to move, but when he came up against a machine gun, there was little chance that you were going to survive. Going to survive. And a very good example of this is in the movie uh, The War Horse, or just War Horse. Uh, and at the very start, they start, you know, going into battle. They're racing against their enemy, and they're just decimated by the machine guns. So another one that really affected the, um, the nature of warfare was the artillery guns. And they could fire large shells over a long distance, usually projecting them in an arc to land on the target from above. Now, they weren't exactly accurate, um, a lot more accurate than the previous ones, but you might have to, you know, it was dependent on certain factors, and you might have to actually, you know, plan it out pretty well. You might have to shoot or fire in one particular spot on numerous occasions. However, trench warfare was pretty stagnant um, when the people were in their trenches. So if they used them in the trenches, you could pretty much assume that eventually they would get the, um, the correct spot. And it was pretty devastating. They were heavy to move. Um, they were mounted on wheels that they, they were just huge and they got stuck sometimes in their own bomb craters, sometimes in the mud, and because they were so heavy, you couldn't get them out, so they were just left there. And that happened quite a lot. Infantry weapons of World War I. The First World War saw many varied weapons used by soldiers. Let's look at what was manufactured and being used on the battlefield. The rifle. Most soldiers would be equipped with a bolt-action rifle. Rounds were fired individually with the bolt being opened and closed after each shot. The rifle was reloaded by loading a clip into the magazine and they had to be cleaned regularly because the dirt in the trenches could jam the firing mechanism. The rifles most commonly used by the Allied powers were the short magazine Lee Enfield Mark III for Britain and the Commonwealth, the Labelle and Berthia 8mm for France, the Monlicher Carcano M1891 6.5 mm for Italy, the Mosin Nagat M1891 7.62 for Russia, and the Springfield 1903 30-06 30 for the USA. For the Central Powers, the rifles used were the Mauser Gewehr 98 7.92 mm for Germany, the Steyr Monlicher M95 for Austria-Hungary and Bulgaria and the Mauser M1877, 7.65 mm for Turkey. The bayonet continued to see use in the First World War. However, its use was now more psychological than practical. They resembled a knife that would fix onto the end of the rifle and be used for close combat fighting. They were also used by soldiers for non-combative use, such as opening cans and toasting bread. 
machine guns of World War I were modeled on Hiram Maxim's 1884 design. With a sustained fire of 450 to 600 rounds per minute, waves of troops could be cut down. Put simply, the machine gun could have the same worth as 80 rifles. Noteworthy weapons include the heavy machine gun used by Germany, the Maschinengewehr 08, the LMG used by British forces known as the Lewis gun which featured a top-mounted pan magazine, and the BAR or Browning automatic rifle which was used late in the war by US forces and was quicker to reload than the Lewis or French shoe shotgun. The submachine guns such as the German MP18 were used in the last parts of the war. The submachine gun was developed during the war as an effective portable firepower solution. They proved effective in close combat trench fighting by German stormtroopers. Flamethrowers were a terrifying weapon, first brought to the battlefields of World War I by the German army. Tanks on the soldiers' back used nitrogen pressure to spray oil fuel, which was ignited as it left the muzzle of a pipe. Grenades were used to clear out the enemy in their trenches and dugouts. They were either hand thrown or fired from a rifle, and depending on the type of grenade, would either detonate on impact or via a timed fuse. The pistol was issued to officers, pilots, and tank operators. Because of the portable size of the pistol, it would serve well in the cramped conditions of a biplane cockpit or the interior of a tank. Lastly, we have the trench raiding club. An almost medieval throwback, this Malay weapon was popular for trench raiding expeditions as a quiet way of killing or wounding enemy soldiers. Now you know about some of the weapons used during World War I. Leave a comment below letting us know which weapon you found the most interesting. Watch our other videos to learn. All right, so in April 1915, Germany introduced poison gas as a weapon of war. So this wasn't mentioned as one of the uh, weapons that was used in as standard measure. And this was otherwise known as chlorine gas, which was blown over the enemy uh, trenches and it burned and destroyed the respiratory tracts or airways of anyone without a gas mask, causing terrible pain and death. So the first people to actually experience this was the Canadians and they had no idea it was coming. And because they had no idea it was coming, what it actually did is it burned you from the inside out and it was so difficult to breathe that eventually you would die. Um, so other gases were introduced throughout the war, including mustard and tear gas. So poison gas attacks were so horrific that the use of chemical and biological weapons was actually banned in 1925, known as the Geneva Protocol. And using any kind of chemical weapons, uh, any kind of gas attacks, would actually be a viola violation of that war, uh, war treaty. And unfortunately, a lot of people have broken it since, but still, there is a thing in place for it. If we actually look at this, You've got the gas. If the wind changed, right, the whole idea was to blow it over, you know, your enemy's trenches. However, the wind would change and it would actually go into your own trenches. And you can see from some of the photos, if you have a look online, it wasn't always effective. Sometimes it even affected you. First World War technology, chlorine gas. In 1914, a chemist called Fritz Haber offered his knowledge to the German army. He soon began experimenting with chlorine gas to be used in trench warfare. In April of 1915, 150 tons of lethal chlorine gas was used by the German forces against the French army at Ypres. The French soldiers witnessed yellow lime clouds with a distinctive smell of pineapple and pepper slowly drifting toward their trenches. The French infantry assumed that the Germans were merely using a smokescreen at first, until they started to complain about pains in their chest and a burning sensation in their throats. As the realization of a gas attack became apparent, the French ran away from the area, putting a gap in the Allied line. The German army was hesitant to advance forward due to concerns for what the chlorine gas would do to them. This enabled Canadian and British troops to recapture the position before German forces could break through. 
Chlorine gas would destroy the respiratory organs of the unfortunate victim and lead to a slow death by asphyxiation. Weather was an important factor in gas attacks. When the British Army launched a gas attack on the 25th September 1915, the wind blew it back into the faces of British troops. This was solved in 1916 when gas shells were used with heavy artillery, increasing the range of attack. So, how would you counter a gas attack? At first, Allied troops used cotton pad masks or even handkerchiefs that had been soaked in urine. The ammonia in the pad, it was discovered, would neutralize the chlorine. As the war progressed, soldiers were equipped with gas masks and anti-asphyxiation respirators, which were more efficient means of protection from gas. Watch our other Alrighty, so you've heard about the chlorine gas and the machine guns, but tanks were also widely used as well. And the British Army were the first to introduce them in 1916 in September at the Battle of Somme, which was a horrific battle, and we'll talk about that um, later. Whilst they were successful at overcoming barbed wire, obstacles and trenches, the mechanical unreliability of those early tanks meant that they were not always useful. And sometimes they actually got stuck and they just left them there. Um, so they were built quickly, so they frequently broke down and become stuck in, um, in muddy trenches. Some trenches were so wide that they literally just fell down in them and they just left them. The crews inside the tanks had to endure unbearable, hot, and noisy conditions, almost constantly choking on the fumes inside the cab. Um, you couldn't move around. It was insane. So by the end of 1917, improvements in the design and manufacture and tank battle tactics made tanks more effective. And that was usually because if you left your tank behind, the enemy could actually check it and you know see what they had done and what improvements they had made, and then they'd make improvements. And then... The other, um, the British or the Germans might then have a look at other improvements that have been made on the tanks that other people have been left uh, have left behind. It was a never-ending battle, and eventually they all improved. First World War Tech, Zeppelins. When a German aristocrat, Brigadier General Ferdinand Zeppelin, retired from the army in 1891, he devoted himself to the study of aeronautics. His proposals to the government for a lighter-than-air flying machine were rejected in 1894, but nevertheless, he would invest all his money into a company producing airships. By 1898, Zeppelin had constructed his first airship. The foundation of the airship were in its hydrogen-filled gas bags, carried inside a steel skeleton. It weighed 12 tons and contained 400,000 cubic feet of hydrogen and was driven by propellers connected to a pair of 15 horsepower Daimler engines. When the Zeppelin LZ made its flight on July 2, 1900, the German government decided to fund the project. In March 1909, the German army purchased the Zeppelin Z1. These Zeppelins could reach a maximum speed of 136 kilometers per hour and reach a height of 4,250 meters. They were armed with five machine guns and could carry 2,000 kilograms or 4,400 pounds of bombs. At the start of the war, Zeppelins were used in bombing raids. A Zeppelin was used to bomb Liege in Belgium on 6th August 1914, but had to make an emergency landing after encountering Belgian artillery fire. Over the next few weeks, Primor Zeppelins were destroyed by ground forces. While the Zeppelins were an easy target to hit, the Germans continued to use them for attacks on France. In January 1915, two Zeppelin naval airships flew over the English coast, bombing Great Yarmouth and Kings Lynn. Zeppelins would commence a bombing raid on London on May 31, 1915 killing 28 people and injuring 60 more. Zeppelins were used at the Battle of Verdun in 1916, with four being brought down by ground fire, bringing an end to their use on the Western Front. They continued to be used to attack the British home front, but British fighter pilots and anti-aircraft gunners became efficient at taking them down. 
115 Zeppelins were used by the German military, with 77 destroyed or damaged beyond repair. After the war, Zeppelins were used for civilian transport. Watch our other videos to learn more. All right, so in the previous video, you saw about the Zeppelins. And Zeppelins were quite important uh, in World War I because they did give a aerial pursuit that was largely unnoticed unless you looked up and happened to see a huge balloon. Right? Some say that they were effective. Others would say they're really not, um, just for the simple fact that they were very slow. Um, they were quite easy to spot. However, they were quiet, which was beneficial. And what they used to do, it was never going to be a, you know, a specific target that they hit. It might be an area that they hit. And they were using World War II as well. And they pretty much bombed, um, you know, London just because, well, they could. So the war at sea was the major one. And this is why Australia got involved in Gallipoli. So in 1914, the sea was, a vi was vital for transportation, trade um, and communications. Protecting sea lanes in your own waters or striking at those of the enemy was an essential part of the war, front, war effort. Submarines were widely used during World War I and initially they were used by the Germans to attack and sink trade ships carrying imported food and vital goods between allied countries. German submarines were commonly referred to as U-boats, short for Unterseeboots. I've said that wrong. So undersea boats. So you've got to remember that at the start of the war, Germany was trying to match British, uh, the British Navy. And every time the Germany would create a new naval ship or a submarine, um, the Britain, Brits would also try to do the same as well. So where World War I was fought. So in World War I, the greatest loss of life took place in Europe with most of the battles taking place in the area in France and Belgium known as the Western Front. However, there are other locations in which World War I took place. And this is mainly to do with Australia, but we'll go from there. So Australia had driven the Germans out of New Guinea by the end of 1914, and they did that with the Japanese. Australia and other British colonies uh, fought in Gallipoli, which most of us know um, occurred, just for the simple fact that it's one of our biggest ones. Australia also fought with the Arab tribes in the Palestine against the uh, Turkish troops, and Japan led raids in, on German vessel, naval vessels in Chinese waters. And during this time, Japan and China were trying to increase their own empire. All right, so if you happen to have a look at this map here, you'll see the neutral states are these countries here. Right. They wanted nothing to do with the war and were left mainly out of it. They did know what was going on, though, because if you're this close to, you know, a war front, you keep a close eye on it. Right. Remember, Belgium was also neutral, but that was ignored entirely. So this is the Western Front here. And then we have another front here. And the Eastern Front goes all along here and down here. Because you remember, the Ottoman Empire was also fighting against Russia as well. And you'll see, you've got some here, Allied defense offensives, right? They've gone into neutral countries. It happened because it could. And this is where Gallipoli is, and this is where we've fought, right? To begin with, that was our major entry into World War One, despite the fact that we had taken back New Guinea. So we were fighting here, and the reason why we were there was because they wanted to get ships through the Mediterranean Sea up this little section here and to get through here and you may be able to see a little blue um, line between those two countries there right that's actually a gap that goes into the Black Sea and they were hoping that they could get supplies down through here up here into the Black Sea and reinforce the Russian Empire it didn't happen mainly because we lost at Gallipoli we didn't lose as many lives as what the Turks did, but we essentially lost the battle. So if you happen to have a look, a majority of the fighting is taking place here. The, the green is the, um, the Allied offensives, and then we've got the Central Power 
that is the little pinkish ones. Now, please keep in mind that we are the green. We are the allies. If we happen to have a look at it, we've got a majority of the countries involved here because we are part of um, certain empires. So let's move on. So the Gallipoli campaign. That was designed to open up access for the Allies. They needed this access in order to get troops and supplies into Russia to aid the campaign on the Eastern Front. In the end, the Gallipoli campaign was abandoned, but not before the deaths of around 140,000 soldiers from countries including Britain, Canada, France, Australia, New Zealand, India and Turkey. However, more than half of those were killed were from Turkey. So they ended up winning the battle but they lost the most amount of men and if you can see here this is where we've actually fought here's Anzac Cove this is where we landed um, and then we've come down here and if we happen to have a look these mount these here are mountains and as we're trying to get through we couldn't go up there I've been to Gallipoli and it's literally a cliff face like this you could not get through and we were trying to claim back this particular peninsula because we wanted to get through here. And those little red things there, they are minefields. And if they thought that if we took back this peninsula, we'd be able to control these minefields. It didn't happen. We did not take back the Dardanelles. The Gallipoli Campaign, 1915 to 1916. World War I. By 1915, the war on the Western Front had fallen into a stalemate. The Allied powers fighting in Belgium and France were considering opening a new front. In January 1915, Grand Duke Nicholas of Russia had appealed to Britain for assistance against the Ottoman Empire, a member of the Central Powers which had invaded the Caucasus. A naval expedition was launched by the Allies to capture the Dardanelles Straits, a passage that connects the Aegean Sea to the Sea of Marmara in northwestern Turkey and beyond that, the Black Sea. If they were successful in their goal, the Allies could link up supply routes with Russia and knock the Ottoman Empire out of the war. Furthermore, as First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill proposed opening another front would dilute the German forces as they supported the depleting Ottoman Turkish army. British Admiralty Winston Churchill pushed for a naval attack on the Dardanelles with a bombardment by British and French battleships on February the 19th, 1915 and resumed on the 25th because of bad weather. The Ottomans had placed mines in the water and the minesweepers had failed to detect many of them. The British also sent Royal Marines ashore to sabotage Ottoman artillery. On March the 18th, Allied battleships entered the Straits. Fire from the Turks and undetected mines sank three of the ships and damaged three others. This naval assault could not work because the Turkish guns needed to be silenced and so did the minefields, which was impossible to do at the same time. The naval ships were also mainly obsolete warships, unsuitable for action. After this failed naval attack, a full-scale amphibious beach assault would begin on the Gallipoli Peninsula. General Ian Hamilton was commander and had assembled 77 ships and 75,000 men. However, he lacked specialist landing craft. Under his command were British forces, ANZAC, standing for Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, and lastly, French troops. The landing started on April 25th. The Allies suffered heavy casualties, establishing the beachheads of Cape Helles and ANZAC Cove on the Aegean coast. The ANZAC forces had landed a little north of the intended landing site of Garba Tepe at a cove instead. The Garba Tepe landings would become known as the ANZAC Cove landings, in honour of the Australian and New Zealand troops who fought valiantly against the determined Ottoman Turkish defenders. After the landing, the Allies could not progress as trench warfare quickly formed like it had done on the Western Front. The summer heat and the dysentery epidemic were unbearable and swarms of flies hung around corpses. Hamilton ordered an attack on Suvla Bay in August involving the landing of 63,000 Allied troops. They were to link up with Anzacs at Anzac Cove and break the stalemate. But indecision meant that the Ottoman Empire would reinforce the position and by August 10th, an attack led by Mustafa Kemal recaptured Suvla Bay. Allied casualties increased and the stalemate continued. Reinforcements were lacking. It was time for evacuation. 
The order to evacuate the Allied troops was given on the 7th of December, with the last troops leaving Suvla Bay and Anzac Cove before dawn on the 20th of December 1915. The last troops left Cape Helles on January the 9th, 1916, and the evacuation was a success with no casualties. The Gallipoli campaign was a disaster for the Allies, who suffered more than 250,000 casualties. While on the Ottoman side, they also had an estimated 250,000 casualties. Gallipoli has become a defining moment in the history of both Australia and New Zealand and has been recognized as their baptism of fire and a key event to their emergence as independent nations. In Turkey, the battle was seen as a significant event in the foundation of modern Turkey and a final victorious defense before the end of the Ottoman Empire. All right, so this week what you're going to be doing is working on a worksheet. Essentially, it's a mapping task um, and actually outlining where Australians fought in World War I. You'll need to go into Google and find out, you know, where, where Australians fought in World War I and then map them. You don't need to label them. You just need to colour them in. This means you'll need to print it off. Or if you're very savvy, you can do it in, I don't know, paint. Paint might work. Um, you'll also need to locate the different Australian battles of World War One and outline the dates. They've got little boxes down the bottom which says which ones you need to look at um, and how many Australian lives were lost. And then you can use your phone. See, there are benefits to working from home. Um, to scan the QR codes. I'm very proud of that one. That lead to various websites and videos that discuss the weapons used in World War One and then write down two or three pieces of information about each of the weapons that you looked at. All right, so essentially it takes you straight to the websites that you need to go to. Um, this is an optional one. So there is some videos you can watch for enrichment. However, if you want to do something creative, you can actually make a periscope. And so essentially what you'll do is there's a template in the worksheet. Once again, it's optional. You don't have to do it. You'll need like a, a thicker card and you'll need some mirrors and some glue or tape, whatever you want to use. Right. Actually make a periscope and it's pretty simple. It's not that hard. It's just getting the mirror that might be problematic. And I'm pretty sure you could use, you know, just get a basic one from like the two buck shop if your parents are going in that direction. Alrighty, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask on Teams and I will see you next week. Bye. References.